uh, first of all, welcome you guys, Terry and Logan. Uh, may I ask you what you guys are going to be studying? Uh, I mean, as far as your major, are you guys both informatics or uh, what are you thinking about? Bioinformatics and informatics. Oh, you can. All right, that's great. That means you come to the right place because both bioinformatics and informatics and actually everything else is going to be driven by an intelligent layer of some sort. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, AI and bots. So let me uh, start by sharing my screen so you guys can see. All right. Uh, Anybody see my screen? Okay. All right, so we can't talk about AI and talk about bots without talking about human intelligence. And if you ask everybody what's a human intelligence, you get so many different answers because so many people think that human intelligence is about intellectual intelligence or spiritual intelligence or some people call it emotional intelligence, et cetera. But the truth is, it, it's a whole lot more than that. In fact, I call it like Gartner calls it, uh, it's literally about actually intelligence square or so many different intelligence we have. We also have spiritual intelligence. We have creative intelligence. We have adversity intelligence. Uh, and that's about different types of ability, like your ability to deal with spatial things, your ability to interconnect with other people or your ability to play sports or uh, do music or all these are different types of human intelligence. So the thing is here is that to me, what matters in human intelligence is like, a human being able to do an intelligent analysis. And that's in essence is about like in looking at needs of technology to needs of business, combining that with the behavior from people and organization and, and business. So you can have some sort of results or outcomes. Now, keeping that in mind, because whoever you're gonna go work for, this is exactly what they're looking for. They're, they're gonna be looking at your ability to understand actually uh, technology and business needs so you can apply it to behavior between business and organization so you can have some results or outcomes and that's basically it doesn't matter what degree you, you're looking at this is really what what it comes out to now uh, the other this begs the question then uh, okay so what about artificial intelligence and also what about this concept of human intelligence versus artificial intelligence what is that all about uh, this also begs the question, is artificial intelligence, is it good for us or is it bad for us? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Now, to explain, I think, artificial intelligence, we, I think we should go back to making the distinction between artificial and natural. And that probably goes back all the way to when man was first created before any type of artificial intelligence uh, conference or before even touring uh, or before even people coined the term artificial intelligence man was created in the image of God. And that was, I think a human being or Adam was actually the first artificial intelligence because he was created by intelligent design, which means a combination of life, consciousness, and intelligence. Now keep that in mind because this is when we start talking about artificial intelligence taking over, et cetera, you might want to refer back to this slide over here. Uh, and because no matter what, okay, we have AI right now, they have reached a certain intelligence such as spatial or mathematical, et cetera, but we're not at the point and we might never be at the point where an artificial intelligence can reach all different levels or different types of uh, human intelligence. Uh, and that includes, of course, the spiritual and, the, and that includes the adversity and, the, and then includes the creative, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, going back to, uh, main question, what is artificial intelligence? And here, I think, if, again, if you ask, you probably get different answer from different people. For some, they'll say, okay, well, it's about machine learning and deep learning. And a lot of people actually confuse the uh, artificial intelligence with machine learning, deep learning, where in fact, uh, artificial intelligence is actually a broad discipline. This is about like trying to create intelligence in machines. So to, to, trying to get machine basically to compute like uh, humans or to think like humans or behave like humans. Uh, machine learning on in the other hand is a subset of artificial intelligence. This is about like using statistical techniques or using uh, or trying to give machine the ability to learn from the data that we feed it or the types of instructions or, or, uh, or what we transfer to the machine. Uh, whereas deep learning is another subset of machine learning, and that's our attempt to mimic 
the activity of our brain, uh, human brain, basically the, the layers of neurons. And the, the word deep learning simply comes from the fact that the more you have neurons layers, the deeper you're talking about. So the, the notion of deep learning for machine learning is, is a reference to the number of layers of neurons that uh, scientists and people are using. A little bit of a history on uh, AI. Uh, it dates all the way back to 1941 when the first electronic computer came about, but we didn't actually have the concept of AI until something around in the 50s. And, and that was coined by uh, John McCarthy. And then of course, later on, we you know, for, fast forward to 1962 and 67, where we see HAL and Space Odyssey, and then moving on to uh, 1971, where we actually have someone from MIT was able to literally create an AI that actually can distinguish uh, words. And, uh, and then uh, in 1975, uh, uh, we adopt the first natural artificial intelligence that was formalized in the form of algorithm. Uh, fast forward again to 1982, uh, we see more creation of uh, self-modifying heuristic AI. And then of course, um, uh, bigger uh, what followed later on uh, in 1990 to 91, where we actually starting to see uh, the interaction between humans and artificial intelligence take, for example, when IBM's uh, supercomputer, uh, Deep Blue, was defeated by, uh, defeated and then was defeated, and was defeated and then defeated, actually, the, the chess uh, champion, Gary Kasparov. And so it's, I'm not going to bore you with the, with the history of that. You can probably look it up later on. Uh, but I do want to touch on where we are today with, so from the main evolution, AI started pretty much with a lot of research and concept, et cetera. And then we find ourselves today, like I said, looking at supervised learning or unsupervised learning. We find ourselves looking at machines being able to learn and even do deep learning through different types of neural networks. And this is a push towards so 20, 2020 and beyond, we probably will be entering what is called the general artificial intelligence. And that applies to literally machines that will become uh, mimic humans in a cognitive way, which means the transfer of a human cognition or human cognitive ability to cognitive computing. Uh, application of AI, there's so many different applications and depending on where you're gonna go in work, you'll probably be touched by one of these at least. Uh, so in AI, it's either about natural language processing or about uh, robotics or about computer vision, speech re recognition, expert system, etc. So in terms of AI versus, uh, versus human intelligence, okay, uh, the main thing here I'd say, okay, is literally to ask that question, is it going to be an AI versus human interaction or relation, or is it going to be a possible war or an impossible war? And there we, there are some people then will ask the question, okay, well, you know, there's so much going on with AI that they fear that AI is going to take over the human race, et cetera. And and part of it is because a lot of people look at AI and say, okay, is AI going to be my best friend? Are we going to like learn to challenge each other, learn to play together uh, or learn together? Or are we going to have AI that will actually be our uh, BFF, best, best buddy, like in this picture, taking selfies and, uh, and being our companion or make AI or uh, uh, robots in the form of AI do our uh, house uh, chores, uh, clean additions, uh, taking care of kids, et cetera, et cetera. All things considered though, there's the other aspect of AI where people are asking the question, particularly some smart people that are cautioning from AI. Take for example, okay, Steve Wozniak, Wozniak okay, who is the, uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Apple. He's like, uh, he is very scared of AI and what he said about AI is also kind of like uh, very uh, cautionary. Same thing with Elon Musk who thinks that AI is a demon that is potentially more dangerous than uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Bill Gates was said about AIs, and I don't understand why people are not concerned about AI. And of course, uh, Stephen Hawkins, before he died, he said a full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human man, uh, mankind or the human race. No, this is reference to uh, general artificial intelligence. And that's, when, that's the type of intelligence, like I said, that would reach all levels of a human intelligence. And I don't think we have to fear that because as humans, we're not really going to get there anytime soon because to create a conscious AI that uh, simulates the human brain completely and the human emotion and all different levels of human intelligence, that's not going to happen anytime soon. 
uh, what we have in AI these days is literally a transfer of our learning to AI. And that's basically transfer, transferring the way we learn. Because for example, I do this in my class when I ask students, okay, how would, I have them actually build a game, okay? And if you take one of my classes, that's one of the things to be doing is like, let's build a game where you, you take pictures of, uh, let's say artists or pictures of uh, actors, et cetera. Okay, take their picture from high school and they, they take their current picture and then put their name and then something uh, famous about them. And then uh, have someone actually match the two. So find out, okay, match high school picture with the actual current picture. Now, how would a human do, learn to do that? Okay, a human learn to do that by looking at the pictures and then processing that in the brain, which means here's the current pictures, here's the, here's the, the other pictures. And of course, uh, uh, associating, associating that with a, a famous movie that they have or a famous quote they have uh, in a name. No, can you have an AI, AI agent learn to do that? The, and the answer is absolutely yes, because uh, you can transfer the way you learn how you match these, these two or how to match a picture from high school to a picture of current actor right now, the same way as a human would learn it. And so in that sense, it's done by creating an artificial agent or an AI agent that does pretty much you like a human, okay? See, have sensors like ears and, uh, and actuators like hands and legs, et cetera. And then uh, through actually, um, through perception and action, that AI agent can learn and can actually perform, uh, perform actions. Now, uh, this is a good example of AI agent learning is like chess, okay? And where of course, um, would you like to play a game of chess? I play very well. That's, uh, that's a little quote, actually a little a snip from the movie, How. Uh, now, the idea here is that an AI agent can learn how to play chess and the same as a human, a human can by transferring the learning instruction to the AI agent by looking at all the very complex moves and going through all of them or learning all of them. Uh, so the question then, can computers learn and adapt? The answer is absolutely yes. And this list is, just, like I said, in uh, some of my classes, I have the student play this game to, to, to create an AI agent that will learn in the example of how to match pictures from high school with pictures of current uh, characters these days. Now, that's actually, uh, a, that's a new paradigm shift in, uh, in AI, where take for example, an AI agent, all you have to do is tell that agent, okay, here's what it means to add, or here's what it means to subtract. So you give it different example of addition. So for example, three is a product of one plus two, five is a product of three plus two, et cetera. And then here's the example of subtraction. Here's the example of multiplying. And then that's how basically an AI agent, they will learn by rule, deriving the rules for each one of these mathematical operations. Whereas a dumb calculator, you pretty much give it all the rules. And that's basically the difference between an AI agent and you know, like smart calculator or super smart calculator with an AI agent or a bot versus uh, just a simple program or a classical calculator. Now that leads us to, this is how we see the rise of bots, okay? Bots or cognitive bots are simply AI agents. That means these are, because a bot can be simply a, just a, a piece of code that does a spe something specific, okay? Like a bot, for example, can help you scan the web looking for your digital footprint. Well, that's just a bot, okay? But if you add an AI agent to that bot or make it a, a cognitive bot, and then that bot can tell you, for example, what's good or what's bad about your, uh, can analyze your foot, digital footprint and tell you what's good and what's bad. Then it becomes an AI agent or a cognitive bot. These days, as it's been, it's been said by many people, bots are literally the new apps. And this is what I say, it doesn't matter what job you're gonna be working, particularly with what's happening with COVID-19. Uh, as soon as COVID-19 hit, actually, a friend of mine that actually uh, works with a major distributor uh, or a publisher called me, he said, man, I have to, the Indian government in making, is making me telling 80,000 of my people go home. Okay, how am I gonna have, how am I gonna staff uh, my call centers, et cetera? That's 80,000 people that work, okay? And the answer to that is, is gonna be very much, okay, look for a way to automate what they do by using bots instead of these people. So you see then COVID-19 is actually uh, precipitating the move toward bots and toward, and, uh, and toward using AI agents to do things that 
that humans uh, were doing, or particularly do things that, that are repetitive and does not require a lot of intellectual uh, capital to do. Now, bots these days, you can use them to, you know, in analytics, so you can use them in tracking uh, what you do, you can use them in, we use them in entertainment, uh, so they can tell you what, uh, what you need to watch or what's good for you to watch, but you can use them in, we use them in different uh, types of utility. Many of you probably use them in gaming or shopping, et cetera. So bots basically are everywhere. And this is, uh, like I said, the Microsoft CEO Nadella said bots are the new apps and he's not the only one. No, basically, what I said, a bot is simply, is like a, a web robot, okay? Which means it's just a simple piece of code. Uh, now, that simple piece of code though, you add some AI to it, or you add, you add some cognitive computing to it, and it becomes uh, a smart bot, okay? Or an AI bot. Not all bots, note to self, not all bots are good, because there's such thing as bad bots, and in fact, we're seeing a lot of bad bots these days, particularly uh, since COVID-19 and also with the previous election, the coming election, et cetera. There's so many, uh, you know, so there's good bots and bad bots. Okay, good bots, we use them to chat. We use them to uh, get reports on earthquakes. We use them to get uh, customer service. Many of you are probably talking to bots and you don't even know that you're talking to bots because many bots literally sound like human, act like a human, and even have some, in, even capable of even displaying some human emotion. Uh, either through voice or either through uh, text. Uh, we use bots to detect fraud, uh, et cetera, but by the same token, other people are using bots to either spread disinformation, as we see in, uh, in several of my classes, all, particularly in the bot class, we talk about, okay, weaponized bots, okay, how bots uh, can be used to, for example, steal election, how bots can be used to persuade people to, uh, uh, to do something, or how bots can be used as, uh, 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 be used in, uh, uh, to weaponize uh, certain and then take over a certain industry or take over a certain uh, uh, company, etc. So the damage that can be uh, that's being done by bots these days is it just keeps in, it keeps mountain and mountain, and to the point like we uh, we look at bots. The biggest threat of bots in terms of bad bot is actually someone being able to create a bot master that can actually take over a bunch of uh, devices. Uh, and as you know, uh, there are billions of devices that are connected these days. Many of these devices can be actually turned into a botnet, which means somebody else using bots to control these devices. And you have, so for example, 350,000 uh, botnets that are found uh, have fake followers. Now, these are Twitter bots, for example, or these are uh, bots in uh, Facebook or Instagram, Instagram and what have you. Uh, and bots, bots have generated something like in uh, Twitter, they generated something like 150,000 tweets per day. Uh, and that number is growing, particularly with the election coming very close, right? Uh, bad bots versus uh, uh, good bots and rising. If we look at, some, this is based on uh, actually uh, research that was not uh, long ago, but 29% of website of website visits are done by malicious bots. But if you look at what's within these malicious bots, there's only 3.5 that is used for as hacking to hack, steal passwords, or uh, or three per, only 3% to scrap uh, scrape the web looking for stuff, uh, and only 0.5% to spam. 22% is impersonator. Impersonators means. They're either someone that is impersonating a human, a bot that is impersonating a human. So like to chat with someone, make them think they're chatting with a person when they're in fact, they're chatting with, uh, with a bot or impersonating humans uh, to spread something or impersonating human, uh, human accounts in, um, in different uh, social media platform, et cetera. So impersonators is probably the biggest rise of bad bots. Uh, a basic anatomy of a bot, okay. Uh, well, I'm gonna stop here for a second and ask you guys actually. Uh, have you guys used bots uh, or have you been, um, or are you aware, aware of some of the bots that you use? And can you guys give me some example of some of the bots that uh, you've used uh, at least within uh, this week or last week? Terry or Logan, go ahead. Or Angela. All right, well, you guys are thinking about that. I'll, I'll keep talking about the basic anatomy of a bot, which is very basic, okay? So here you have a bot, 
uh, which is think of it as like I said an AI agent okay and then you have humans and humans will need to go through channels either like Facebook Skype or web chat direct line email whatever uh, in order to communicate with that bot to send let's say an email an email then will go through the bot connector in this case use a Microsoft bot or Microsoft platform uh, and then that bot will take that uh, and then interface with either different web application or interface with an AI cognitive uh, layer in order to return something to the human in the form of either a message or an email or what have you. Now, that's a very basic anatomy. Now, in one of my classes in bots, I actually have my students uh, create different bots. I'm gonna talk about what matters most and forget the, forget the, the, the function there. And it's, it's something that you're gonna learn in future classes uh, if you haven't taken some, some of the classes that I do in, in bots. But, Everything about bots is about design data systems, and then it's all about processes, workflows, and then understanding roles and functions, and then functionality. So uh, let me skip that because that would, you will learn that in some of the classes. But take, for example, the bot that we, uh, I have my students create uh, that I call it an edu bot, okay? In this case, okay, uh, to create this bot, the, the what matters most is like i say is understanding the design and understanding what is it that you're creating the bot for in this case the whole idea here is let's say the first bot i have create is to uh you want to for example uh you want a bot that will tell you how to pass this course or you want a bot that would actually give you the answer to a quiz or you want a bot to uh, uh that will give you the answer to a final exam i literally taught my students how to actually create a bot which they can take that same bot and then convert it to, to a bot that becomes an informational source it will tell them a lot of things about the, about the course, including how, answer to a final exam. Uh, and, that, and that's how simple it is to create a bot. Now, in this case, okay, the bot that I have for my class, okay, here you have SOIC faculty, which me, for example, sitting at home. You have students that are in the classroom or you have SOIC students sitting at home. Okay, going through a given channel, whether it's a Skype or whether it's uh, or whether it's actually um, uh, Facebook or whatever channel, uh, that giving them connection then to this bot framework. In this case, it's the Microsoft uh, Azure bot. Okay, now that's as an as an AI bot platform that gives us give you access to natch to cognitive services, including uh, Louis here, which Louis is an actual. That's the uh, language understanding uh, intelligence uh, services okay and that would give you actually also access to all the different things that they have for to build a bot including the standard um, uh, uh, standard thing if standard languages such as uh, JavaScript or Python etc and then that also gives you access to bot services uh, and give you access also to hosting that bot so in essence then to create this bot Okay, you can have this bot interface with the student information system, which is the IU, so get information about you, about my students. It can also have my bot interface using different dialogues to interface with the, the library and also the, the Canvas system. So my students can literally ask the bot, for example, about something in my class, okay? And uh, let's say, okay, uh, what's covered in this exam, or what's covered? What's covered in this module? Or when is this uh, thing? Uh, when is this due, etc. The reason why I created this bot and and testing that bot in my classes is then uh, students ask all kind of things, but uh, many times students ask the same thing, right? So there are frequently asked questions. In this case, this my this bot that I created is actually collecting uh, frequently asked questions and then turning that into insight. So, for example, if I see a bunch of students asking about this, then I can make an announcement, okay? Uh, or uh, if the students don't find something within the course stuff, it, it, the bot can reach out to the library and get the answer from that. Uh, now, what's the role of AI in creating these bots? The main role of AI in creating these bots is that most important piece there is the natural language processing. Now, the next natural, natural language processing is about a couple of things here. We as a human, we use language to communicate, right? Well, bots and AI, uh, they use natural language processing so they can actually either do understanding of common language like English or generation of uh, generating common language like English. Uh, now, the other thing too is that
here's an example. Okay, Louis. How did Microsoft actually create Louis? The Louis was created as a language understanding intelligence service, which then, if you create a bot using the Microsoft Azure, you have access to this Louis, which then allows you to create either your own module of understanding English or providing uh, a way to train your bot on understanding certain English phrases, English words, etc. Uh, and being able to integrate that into your bot so you can publish it, something that we also learn in a bot class. Now, the primary uh, thing for us as a human is also speech. We recognize when we hear something, somebody talk, we recognize words and phrases and et cetera. Well, the same thing for AI, by the natural language processing uh, uh, allows also AI to be able to recognize and advance the, the goal of natural language processing by simplifying and making the interaction between a human and a computer possible. The other thing too is that the role of AI in bots is allowing bots to have vision. Well, that's through sensors, okay? We see through our eyes where bots can see through uh, sensors, they can see through uh, cameras, they can see through, through different types of computer vision devices or even uh, technology devices that allows a bot then to be able to recognize something or see something. Now, let's say you wanna build um, a bot, okay? The pro it's, a, it's a whole process and that process uh, is, depends again on you understanding what is it that, what's my intent with this bot? And then understanding what are the utterances and then I will talk that, about that here just in a second. Uh, but first I wanna say that, let's say you wanna build a, a bot and your intent here is to make that bot uh, help you with trading, okay? So your intent that is you're looking for a bot that gives you answer about stocks, okay? Well, when to sell, when to buy, okay? Or what, to, or rating stocks. So that is your intent. Now the utterances is about how actually, how exactly you're gonna achieve that, uh, that intent. Uh, now, uh, a Microsoft bot service, such as the Microsoft Azure, okay, or um, uh, Amazon, or if you use an IBM Watson, or it's, there's tons and tons of different types of actually platform out there. And we kind of cover most of them, or we cover the most important ones that are out there to allow you, uh, to allow students to actually build different types of bots, which I'm gonna get to here in a second. Now, uh, so let's say in, in healthcare, okay? In healthcare, I have my students actually, particularly like right now with COVID-19, okay? Uh, I have my students, let's say, the use, and I give them actually a bot template for uh, COVID-19. And then I ask them to convert that to create a COVID-19 bot that helps SOIC student get answer about COVID-19 or take a COVID-19, uh, um, uh, get answer to a COVID-19 questions. And so that pertains specifically to SOIC students or IU uh, School of Informatics students, et cetera. Now, before I go on, I want you to actually kind of, um, and hopefully here we still have time to do something like this. I want you to turn, turn to your Siri, whether you have a Siri or Alexa, or what have you, okay? And just while you're still on mute, okay? Ask Siri, okay? Tell Siri exactly this. I have a terrible headache. Can you help? And see what you get. Now, many of you are gonna get different answers. You're gonna get like, for example, well, here's a, I know of a pharmacy close by, or I know, uh, or, uh, or I know, uh, or they might play something, or, or in some cases, it might even give you uh, a list of songs that have to do with uh, headache or et cetera. Now, now, that's kind of general and that's kind of crazy because you get so many different answers, even though you're asking, supposedly you, you're asking the same, uh, the same personal assistant here, in this case, Siri or Alexa being the same, uh, the same artificial AI bot, right? But that is not the case. Now, uh, turn around to, again, to Siri or Alexa, and in this case, literally say this to her, or to him and whichever you have on, uh, on your smartphone, okay? Say, this is not helpful, help me with my headache and see what you get. See, once again, you're getting all kinds of different answers, right? And if I stop for, you know, if we have time here, we'll probably go over so many different, I have my students actually go over different answers because it's crazy the, the different answers that you get. 
The reason why is because Siri or Alexa was not built as your personal assistant. Plus, Siri or Alexa is not interested in learning about uh, learning uh, uh, from you as much as it's interested or is built to learn about you. So it's learning, for example, things you look at, things that you visit, things that, uh, and this is why you get a crazy answers such as, well, here's a song or here's a list of songs or here's uh, uh, some advertisement to a certain thing, but it's not. But imagine for a minute if, that, if, that, if you had that bot that was built specifically for you as actually a healthcare bot. So if you ask it, it can literally give you a good answer to how you're gonna deal with your headache or maybe prompt you with different answers and then walk you through and then find out exactly what type of headache do you have. Uh, and of course the answer is, uh, is that possible? Has it been done? It is being done. And in many cases, there are actually different types of uh, healthcare bots that would do exactly that and healthcare bots is not something new it goes back all the way to probably 1964 and 66 uh, elisa for example was the first health bot that was created and these days health bots okay they can sound a little bit more human but okay? if instead of like for example telling you uh, uh just give me more information it might say uh, oh i'm sorry that you have a headache let's see how i can help you so bots are being created or learning to act more human. That's the thing about that worries some people. And that's why in some cases, then we ask the question, okay, at one point then, do we actually start to fear AI bots replacing human healthcare or replacing um, uh, people in healthcare? Or the question that we ask, and uh, as we look at different types of healthcare bots, we ask, okay, well, to what point actually um, healthcare bots become actually a substitute and also uh, can they actually uh, serve different people? And this is then becomes a notion of actually uh, these bots are built basically by human and they learn from the human. So they may actually, at some point, they may learn to give, uh, learn to give the wrong answer or uh, to mislead uh, because they have a certain preference which built into them because that's a human algorithm that, that transferred to them. Now, all the things that we do, and I'm gonna skip the healthcare here to get to something else that, uh, if I give you this chart right now, which I do in my bot class, so I give them this chart right here and said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Look at this chart, and I want you to think about uh, a couple things here, okay? How can you actually, looking at this chart, how can you make the connection where you can use AI bots to either steal election and destroy the democracy or the opposite of that to where actually you can uh, help democracy and help 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 the uh, make sure that the election is not uh, is not going to be stolen there's a couple things here okay and i have different students do different things now notice that the answer to that is of course take what happened okay where uh, for example here we have uh, a bunch of uh, russian uh, chose to do it to build uh, to use Twitter bombs and they literally have Twitter factory and they they hacked into the the uh, the data center of the Democratic uh, Party they also had uh, built a bunch of troll farms so they can use a bunch of fake uh, Facebook accounts and Instagram accounts etc and then that's given through the internet that gave them access to people through through the media and social media, et cetera, and voters. Well, that's one way to steal election, you see. So making that connection with bots, using bots, in this case, to, to uh, change the outcomes of politics, or you could, you could think about it the other way around, is you can actually make some connection here or how you actually, uh, uh, how you actually make sure that the election is not gonna be stolen. Now, um, I'm not going to go over uh, political bots, etc. You probably learned that in some uh, future classes, but let me get for the sake of time. I do want to get to what we do an example of using social media and, uh, and bots in social media. Okay, there's so much disinformation happening right now in social media, but a lot of it is pushed by actual bots and impersonators, uh, bots are impersonating people. Now, that is such a problem because that these type of bots in the real world example uh, of pushing disinformation, they can create, uh, they can damage corporate reputation. They can actually also, uh, uh, they can be used to as a cultural weaponizing to again, make people vote a certain way or behave a certain way, or they can use in uh, to manipulate the stock markets and so forth. 
Now, another example that we do in, um, in my class is uh, Botifying Religion. In this case, I actually, uh, I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing here. I want you to turn to your Siri or to your Alexa and say this uh, to Siri Alexa, say a prayer for me and see what you get. Okay, so you probably got some crazy answers again. And, and so at this point, maybe, you know, say it to, uh, to Siri Alexa, say it very strongly in a very strong tone. That's why I have that capitalized. Simply say, pray for me. Okay, what happened there? Siri or Alexa is not gonna pray for you. In fact, it probably play a song. Uh, that has to do with prayer for you, or it may say, uh, uh, give you something else crazy like, uh, I don't know how to deal with that, or, uh, uh, or give you some crazy answer completely. And here, when I have my students do this, we get all kinds of crazy answers. The main idea is, again, is that Siri or Alexa is not built as a spiritual bot or as a religious bot. But imagine if you have a, religi a religious or spiritual bot that you can turn to. Now, is that not happening? It is happening in some places like Japan where some people are turning actually to worship uh, Mindar, a Buddhist robot, or uh, people that are actually uh, are going into this AI church that was created by a guy that used to work for Google. Uh, now, the idea here is that, okay, there's so many questions there about having an AI uh, religious bot or having an AI spiritual bot, okay? And this is where I have my students then ask themselves the question after, after they uh, deal with Siri or Alexa, okay? Can AI, suppose you have this AI uh, as a bot that can say a prayer for you. Then you might ask yourself a question. How is God gonna, will God take the prayer from an actual device that's digital that doesn't have a soul? Uh, or you might ask also, uh, we might ask the question also, uh, does also, can AI or cognitive bot uh, comfort someone and help them spiritually? Uh, or can even an AI bot help convert someone from Judaism to Christianity or from this to that? These are all different questions that we actually, we address uh, in some of the courses that when we talk about bots, but once we actually learn how to create this bot or use an example of this bot. Um, now, uh, there's, there, there's actually an example here, which I would ask you to take a look at, uh, including that um, AI God uh, from the West Coast or even the, the, the other, uh, the Mindar God from Japan. Uh, but take what uh, Elon Musk here uh, about, again, artificial intelligence saying, uh, we're summoning the demon if we, t if we actually create an artificial intelligence that can, create, that can act as a God. And there's so many different things and so many different actually discussion in that, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one thing to, uh, to note here is different examples, as you probably see, and again, I'm not gonna uh, dwell so much on this because um, we, do cover, uh, uh, we do cover, for example, that this whole concept of uh, AI and cognitive bots becoming, uh, becoming a god or becoming a religious entity. Uh, and we go so many different, uh, for the sake of time here, I'm not gonna actually play some of this video, but I do encourage you to, uh, to go back and take a look at so, some of them. Now, um, we also do Botifying education in, in one of the classes. And this is where I said, uh, having students build their own informational bot to help them uh, pass a quiz or to help them pass an exam. Uh, now, uh, doing so, uh, like I said, is actually quite simple because you have uh, what matters here is having an actual what what, what matters here is having access to uh, uh, to a platform and understanding uh, a bot framework i'm going to focus a little bit on ai chat chat boss before i give you uh, 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 there's no there's no actually presentation or uh, no class without homework so i'm going to give you a, a quick homework to do which is uh, learning how to do your own chat bot you know, some fun facts about chatbots. You know, hundreds of thousands of people, actually, they do say goodbye or they say good morning or something to Alexa every day, right? Uh, there's probably half a million people or more that have professed that they, how much they love Siri or they love Alexa or what have you. And then, and interestingly enough, there's more than 250,000 people that actually propose marriage to a virtual assistant, not knowing that or knowing 
that that virtual assistant is an actual is an AI bot. Now, some interesting facts here, okay, is that, and why I think this is so important, is that some facts to consider is that bots make up up to 52 of online traffic versus 48 traffic by people. And that number is gonna grow and significantly grow, particularly past COVID-19 and what's, what's happening with uh, these days, where people actually, not just organization are doing, going through a digital transformation, but we also as a humans, going through a digital transformation, including what we're doing right now, having this the discussion virtually, okay? Now, uh, another thing that I wanna note, um, I'll let you guys go through this, um, uh, some of this, I'll post the slides or uh, Angela will send them to you so you can go, go back and go through them. But history of chatbots before I turn you loose on uh, creating yours. Like I said, chatbots is not something new. It actually started back in the 60s uh, with Elisa. It was followed by Jabberwacky in 1988. And then of course, uh, uh, fast forward to 2010 and 2016, uh, we have uh, Siri in 2010, followed by uh, Google in 2012, and then Tay in 2016. And this chat boss just keep getting smarter and smarter. The basic thing about what you need to learn and what you need to know about chatbot and how to create one is again, having a data set that you can transfer to your chatbot. And also understanding that unless you have a, a knowledge management uh, 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 pieces, uh, and that has to do again with your intent of the bot and what that bot is gonna perform. And then having access to a platform that's gonna allow you access to a natural language processing and also how you will develop uh, some custom functionality such as uh, having your bot tell you, for example, okay, what's the best match for you? Okay, or having a bot tells you what's the correct answer to uh, a final exam and so forth. Now, uh, there's so many different types of chatbots. And again, you'll see that from the slides that I'll send you a copy of, including uh, Live Person or Ada, or, and then there's tons of different examples uh, like Live Chat and HubSpot. And some of you may probably may have used some of these. Uh, the new reality about chatbot is that this chatbot, the algorithm is getting so powerfully powered to the point that the conversation and even the voice is becoming more and more human. Uh, another reality about the chatbots is that with more advances toward general artificial intelligence, and then we're seeing more of the chatbots being able to actually not only sound more human, but also display some level or some some actually some uh, human uh, behavior such as sentiments or, uh, or such as um, a human action or human behavior of some sort. Now, according to a digital uh, health report released uh, from Juniper here, uh, if we take a look at uh, chatbots in healthcare, for example, uh, that's a huge market and that's growing right now because of COVID-19 significantly because chatbots in healthcare is, is a huge saving uh, when it comes to saving time and money. And one more reason why, again, those of you that are going into uh, bio, uh, bioinformatics or anything that relates to healthcare, you'll see a lot more and more of that. There are actually several chatbots that are, again, that become part of the new reality, such as Replica. In this case, if, you've, uh, if you know about Replica, this is the type of uh, chatbot that can be your friend, virtual friend, and can also be able to chat with you. Uh, and you can check it out and say, see it for yourself. Some people actually swear by it, say that's like the best friend. Uh, there's another uh, chatbot example like the, the WeBot, and we, we go over that, or the WoWeBot. We go over that also in one of the classes because this is more of a meaning, a, a, a chatbot that was created and it's got built-in algorithm that actually help you improve your mood. And some people again swear by it and say it does help them like, you know, from being sad to being, you know, to be becoming happier or uh, because uh, this chatbot is able, is capable of displaying some sympathy or empathy and so forth. Uh, another example is Ginger. Okay, Ginger was uh, created as a chatbot that can offer, offer uh, mental health. And I also encourage you to check it out just to take a look at it. And you can see that uh, this type of chatbot can actually uh, not only does access to uh, give you access to behavioral health uh, coaching in terms of like uh, helping people with uh, uh, as a behavioral coach, it, it can also have access to all types of video therapy and video uh, psychiatry, etc. And so it is. It, it, you can consider that more of a, an empathy feeling type of uh, chatbot. 
uh, no, to build your own, your first chat bot, which will be your homework following this, uh, this session. And I wanna make sure that I'm still, oh, I'm actually going over time. All right, uh, you're gonna have to decide whether you wanna, you want your bot to be either a rule-based chat bot or simply to be an AI chat bot. And there I included the difference between, between the two. And you, you'll see that if you actually end up taking any of these classes on bots, uh, we will cover that in different classes. However, here's what I invite you to do. You can take a look at different types of uh, chatbots platform out there, from IBM Watson to Teneo to TARS. Many of them actually will give you a free, uh, free download or free trial so you can build your uh, chatbot. In this case, you can make your chatbot about either to do a basic um, uh, interaction with you, or you can build a chatbot. Let's say, follow one of the examples that I did in classes where you want your chatbot, again, to feed it a bunch of answer to different questions, and then let it learn this, the, the answers uh, based on the different, different answers you give about uh, each question. That way, that bot can become smarter at answering, for example, things about, let's say, uh, music for you or things about, let's say, uh, a subject that you like so much, like uh, uh, astrology or what have you. Um, Microsoft uh, bot framework that you would, uh, you would use, uh, for this I would say th there's a couple options here. Option one, you can use actually one of this, um, one of this tutorial to, uh, to build your own chat bot. Uh, I would suggest also using something that's very easy, such as uh, chat fuel. Uh, or the Microsoft Azure, or you can do uh, another one option that you could use for this uh, activity. You can also use Facebook. Now, Facebook does actually provide you with, enough, with a way to create your own chatbot and also host them in Facebook and, and have your interface already in, uh, in uh, using the, uh, the messenger of Facebook. So with that, I'm gonna stop there and uh, just, uh, before actually, before I stop, I would say that the future of AI and bots, they're here and they're here to stay. And so whether this is gonna be in, um, in for to, to be a virtual assistant to you or whether you're gonna use them in, uh, in automation in your future job, or whether you're gonna use them to integrate application that you use on your desktop or your devices, or whether you're gonna use them for different types of cognitive computing that many organizations are doing, that's your future. Uh, as you finish your, uh, as you complete, as you complete your degree, and then move on to an actual job, or maybe even take a part-time job in the future. So I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions. Awesome, thank you, Fozzie. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or to unmute yourselves and talk. Um, Fozzie, I'll catch you up. We've been having a fun conversation in the chat during this. Um, when you asked for examples of bots we'd interacted with, almost everyone said chatbots um, and chatbots and customer service. Logan talked about bots he's using in his Discord server. And then we all shared our amusing responses that we got from our smart assistants. Oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, bottom line, like I said, uh, it doesn't matter what future, uh, you're looking at, I can guarantee you bots is part of that future <laughs> or AI is part of that future. And the reason why I said this, and I've been saying this to actually all my students, is because we're no longer looking at the old way of computing. We're moving into an, an era of what I call cognitive computing. A lot of people are like, you know, it's like, why, what do you mean by cognitive computing? It's like, you know, cognitive is, only humans are able of doing uh, uh, cognition and say, well, no. The reality is that uh, operating systems like Microsoft and, uh, and Apple system, and say, they're all going to be replaced by an actual AI operating system where the input is going to be natural language and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and from uh, machine learning to deep learning to computer vi vision. And then the output is going to be everything smart. So it's no longer about input through a mouse or input through a keyboard going through a Microsoft operating system. And then you need a compiler and you need a language uh, such as Python or uh, uh, JS or what have you, all that's going to go. Okay, so the future is literally going to be in cognitive computing, which is basically another way of saying AI and bots. So we have a question from Taryn. Um, she asks, in healthcare, could bots slash AI have a bias when treating patients causing misinformation with the diagnosis 
since they are learning from humans. Oh, absolutely. In fact, that is actually, uh, take for example, what happened, uh, already happened, where uh, uh, several companies that created bots and had bots actually start to chat. And then they, because they learn from the algorithm that was passed to them. So they learn to actually, they learn bad things from the people that created them. So bias is always something there because we have, as a humans, we transfer our bias into the algorithm that we create for bots. So in fact, bots can learn to lie. Bots can learn to actually do malicious things such as deliberately even lie. They can learn to lie. Uh, because it's a transfer in the, it's a transfer learning from the person that actually created the algorithm for them. So bias is already there. In fact, one of the things that we talk about in some of my classes is that a lot of people go through, uh, they're actually misjudged by uh, bots because uh, employers use bots to build a persona. Okay. Now, if these bots have a bias, they may actually drop a candidate or mark a candidate low because there's bias built into that, just as it would be in healthcare. So in healthcare, you could have an AI bot or you could have an AI system that actually leads to a wrong diagnosis because it learned that from the algorithm that it was fed. So Fazi, um, will you talk a little, bit about, a little bit about what classes you teach and a little bit about your background? Right, so my background has always been in, uh, my original background was in intelligence. I spent many years in intelligence, that's a human intelligence, um, uh, some government work and then led to software development. Uh, I've always been a software developer of uh, some sort, even when I went back to teaching. Uh, now, um, uh, as far as the two courses that I teach, I teach uh, social informatics, which is just looking at the impact of technology in individuals and humans. And we talk about different things in that class, particularly, for example, okay, like uh, the impact of cyberbullying or the impact of using certain technology, like uh, disinformation being what I call the web disease, for example. Uh, and then we, and, uh, and then another course where we actually take the other side of uh, informatics, which is the applied side, that's in organizational informatics. So understanding how to actually look at technology, uh, not just as, as uh, uh, what's, the, you know, using technology for technology, but rather using technology to meet the needs of the people in the business. Uh, and then uh, in uh, bots and uh, AI bots and automation, that's where we literally get into learning how to create different bots, such as a religious bot or, a, or a educational bot or a, a botifying politics or botifying uh, uh, education and so forth. And we also look at the social impact of them. So like when we create a religious bot, we ask again questions such as, okay, would, would, it's, can a bot replace a, a guru or replace a spiritual uh, person, et cetera. Uh, and then the other course that I teach is uh, informatics project management. Uh, and that's a different aspect or a different actually, um, that's how you would literally come out with a plan to build uh, a, either an informatics system or an application or uh, or an IT project of some sort. Very cool. Hopefully, um, you both will have Fozzie at one point in your career at IPY. Any final questions? We have about five minutes left. If not, thank you both so much for joining us. I learned a lot during this presentation. I think I might even try making a bot after this. I'll put um, my very low skills to the test. Um, but we will, we did record this today, so we'll be on YouTube later and we'll follow up with any links to videos in this presentation so you can look at them later. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. Bye guys. Bye, Bye. everybody. And uh, we'll see y'all later. Mm -hmm.